Over the past decades, science has found new ways to explore reason itself. Um, results from uh, probability theory, decision theory, and economics um, tell us about the structure of consistent rational thought, <coughs> um, while extraordinary experiments from cognitive psychology um, have revealed uh, myriad consistent ways that our reason falls short of this regular uh, standard. Um, I'm going to um, give a, a brief introduction to these um, extraordinary results from the, the field of cognitive psychology, uh, and then talk a little bit about the, uh, the mathematical, what, what mathematics has been able to teach us uh, about how uh, consistent reasoning can work. And <coughs> myself and Rocco are contributors to the website uh, lesswrong.com, which describes itself as a community website for advancing the uh, art of human rational, refining the art of human rationality. Uh, Lesswrong.com was founded by uh, Eliezer Yudkowsky, who is a uh, research fellow at the Singularity Institute for Artificial Intelligence, uh, under the auspices of the Future of Humanity Institute in the Department of Philosophy at Oxford University. Um, and uh, it's fair to say that the, a lot of the ideas that myself and Rocco would be drawing on in this talk come from the essays on the Less Wrong website. Um, so, for the first essay, that, for the first experiment I want to introduce you to, uh, I'll take you back to 1982. <coughs> so, it's the Cold War, I've uh, got Ronald Reagan and Leonard Brezhnev over there pointing nuclear arsenals at each other. And it's against this backdrop um, in July 1982 in Istanbul uh, that uh, professional forecasters from industry and from academia gathered at the Second International Congress of Forecasting. And it was at this conference that uh, Daniel uh, Kahneman and Amos Tversky, um, who would later win the Nobel Prize um, in economics for, the, for this kind of research, um, carried out an extraordinary experiment. Um, they spoke to um, over 150 participants at the conference, and they divided them into two groups. <coughs> so the first group was asked to assess the probability of a complete suspension of diplomatic relations between the USA and the Soviet Union sometime in 1983. <coughs> while the second group was asked to a probability of a Russian invasion of Poland and a complete suspension of diplomatic relations between the USA and the Soviet Union sometime in 1983. Well, well the good news... Let's ask the audience, well, which do the audience... <laughs> well, it's, they it's know what happened, though. I mean, there's spoilers. <laughs> which is most likely? <laughs> which of their thoughts is yeah. most likely? If you, if you were asked this question, which one would you think is most likely? First group. <laughs> they might um, not be uh, one... One event might be conditional on the other event, so they might be more likely to suspend the diplomatic relations if they invaded Poland. So. That's true, so but that isn't what the question is. Uh, um, well, the um, second group, the, the good news is they all gave it fairly low probability. You know, the, the average is, the median was less than uh, 1%, not, not the median, it was actually a geometric mean, anyway. Um, they, they gave numbers overall less than 1%, um, but what's worrying is, that this second group gave results higher than the first, um, roughly three times higher. Um, and what's wrong with that is that if this happens, any time this event happens, this one also happens. If there's a Russian invasion of Poland and a suspension of diplomatic relations, then there's always a suspension of diplomatic relations. There's no way that the second event can happen without the first, but the reverse isn't true. Perhaps Russia could nuke an American city and that would result in a suspension of diplomatic relations. And so there's this, this strange reversal in the probabilities that they, um, that, that the, uh, these people who are, bear in mind that they are professional prognosticators who, who uh, think about the future for a living, have this seemingly uh, you know, large and bizarre error in the way that they're thinking about the likelihood of these events. Um, so this reveals what we call a cognitive bias. And uh, a cognitive bias is a, is a failing in our thought which is, is not just random, it's not just that we, we make mistakes as we all do sometimes, but that we consistently, instead of hitting the bullseye, we're consistently sending the darts to one side, to say to the left of the, of the, of the bullseye. Um, we're not just failing to hit it, we're consistently erring in a particular direction. Because the error is consistent, and because it's systematic, that means that we're um, able to find it by experiment, that we can, exactly as they did, take a group of, sus of, of subjects um, and measure the way that measure the mistakes they make and find that they're consistently on one side of the line instead of the other, on one side of the bullseye. And the reason we're able to say that it's a mistake 
is because we're comparing the um, decisions, of the judgments that they made to a, a mathematical model of um, what would be a reasonable decision, and in this case, probability theory. We're able to say that the first, um, the second statement is a conjunction of the first statement and something else, and probability theory tells us that the conjunction of A and B cannot be more likely than A by itself. And so we know that, we don't know exactly what the two probabilities should be, but we know that this one has to be this side of this one. We know that it can, cannot make sense to cross them over. Um, because we have a, a model of what probability theory, of, of, of what is a, a plausible way to do probabilities. So, <coughs> when you hear about an experiment like this, you think, well, does this, this is trying to measure a certain you know, aspect of human reasoning, but is it really measuring what it's trying to measure? Um, could there be another explanation for why these people gave the answers they did? Is it possible that our way of looking at it is not, uh, is not really an accurate way of understanding what's going on in their heads? And that's, that's the appropriate uh, reaction to an experiment like this, I think. It's, sci it's a proper scientific skepticism when you encounter an experiment like this. What, what other hypothesis might account for the results that we've seen? Um, and that's why the... Um, so that the paper this is drawn from is all about this, this one bias, which is about when the conjunction of two events, A and B, is seen as more likely than the one event A. So it's, it's called conjunction bias. Um, the uh, paper this experiment is drawn from, which is all about conjunction bias, um, doesn't just present this one experiment. In fact, it presents 22 different experiments um, evaluating different aspects of this thing. They've, whenever they do an experiment, they think, well, is there another hypothesis that could account for this than conjunction bias? And they devise another experiment that would check for that hypothesis, that would look for, that would draw a line between the, these two possible hypotheses of what might be happening in these people's heads. And, um, this, this paper from 1982, it's, it's a classic paper uh, with over 1,400 sites on Google Scholar. Now, some of those will be duplicates, but a great many of them will be further experiments building on this work, you know, drilling down further into the, the exact mechanism of what's going on and discarding other alternate explanations uh, of what might be happening. So it's important to bear in mind that in this talk, I can only give a, a very light smattering of some of the experiments that are happening. It's important to bear in mind that each one has dozens of other experiments standing behind it to drill down to the, uh, find the exact inconsistencies that I'm uh, describing in this talk. Um, so I'll, I'll give just one example. Um, supposing you would say, well, you know, these people were asked to um, give this probability, which is maybe a slightly artificial feeling way of, of talking about likelihood. Maybe their, their intuitive sense of which of the two events is more likely is spot on. Maybe they understand intuitively that the first one is more likely but it's when they're asked to translate it into numbers that everything goes wrong. Um, so I'll present a, a second experiment from, from this same paper um, that addresses that possibility. <coughs> so now we're, we're going to discard, we're not going to ask anyone to estimate anything, we're not going to ask people to talk in terms of probabilities, we're just going to um, ask people to say which of these things do you think is most likely. So we take a, um, a die and we paint four of the faces green and two of them red. So when we roll it, we're twice as likely to get green as red. And we ask our subject um, to choose between um, one of these three sequences. Can people read what these say? Yeah. So this one is RGRRR, GRGRRR, or GRRRRR. And we ask them, you pick one of these three sequences, and we're going to roll this die 20 times. And if at any point in that rolling, this sequence comes up, if we, if I'm uh, um, sitting there and I roll it, you know, R, R, G, G, R, R, G, um, and then it comes up G, R, G, R, 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 say, then if you chose this sequence, um, then you win $25. This was done with, with re real rewards of $25, and 65% of those surveyed chose this second sequence here. Um, now, it should be clear that the second sequence is going to be a, a better bet than the third. Um, they're both the same, except this has got a G in the third place, but that's got an R in the third place. G is twice as likely as R, um, so it's, it's definitely a better bet than the third sequence. But what 65% of these subjects missed is that every single time this sequence comes up, this one comes up too, because that, that has RGRR uh, right in the middle of it. Um, so there's no way you can do better by choosing the second sequence than you can with the first. And again, the reason people choose it is because it's of a bias in favour of representativeness. That uh, uh, because the dice is more likely to roll green than red, 
a sequence with more green in it seems more representative 